Part of the excitement for me of this event is to have a chance to gather together a number of scholars and preachers, all of whom are very well known, but who represent different and vital preaching traditions in the church today. What binds them together is a conviction that God's word, in fact, can turn the world. In anticipation of the couple of days that we're going to have together, it's my privilege now to turn things over to our President Rick Blees, who has some words of welcome for us. President Blees. Again, my name is Rick Blees. I'm president of Luther Seminary, and I also want to extend my welcome to you to be a part of this very exciting first annual celebration of biblical preaching. We're very, very excited, as David mentioned, that you're here. We've been planning and dreaming about the event for a long time. And you should also know we've been praying for you and your participation, that this would be a time of renewal, of challenge, of support, and that the Holy Spirit would, as we gather together to support each other in this important ministry, that the Spirit would speak to us during these days together. We know that biblical preaching is at the heart of healthy congregations, congregations that are being renewed, those that are capturing a missional imagination. And I'm really looking forward to many things about the next few days, the lectures, the workshops, the worship. But to be honest, I'm really looking forward to especially the biblical preaching. I want to especially thank uh, David for your sermon this morning, which really touched me, and I look forward to that kind of inspiration uh, throughout our time together. And so, again, uh, we want to welcome you. If you have any needs while you're here, please turn to me or our staff. Uh, we want to give you every support. God bless you during this time. Thank you. It is my great privilege to introduce to you someone who is truly one of the living legends in the world of evangelical preaching. Haddon Robinson is the Harold John Okenga Distinguished Professor of Preaching at Gordon-Conwell Seminary in South Hamilton, Massachusetts, and the co-director of the Doctor of Ministry program there. Previously to his tenure at Gordon-Conwell, he taught at Dallas Theological Seminary and Denver Seminary, where he also served as president a position he also was asked to hold for a time at Gordon-Conwell. His career and impact have traversed numerous media as he has hosted television and radio programs in addition to writing for and serving on the boards of numerous publications. He is also the author of a number of books, the best known of which is Biblical Preaching, The Development and Delivery of Expository, Mes of expository Messages, Nearly 30 years after its publication, it continues to be a central text in evangelical preaching circles and beyond, having sold more than 200,000 copies, which I guess means that you can truly say that Haddon Robinson wrote the book on biblical preaching. <laughs> so please join me now in welcoming Haddon Robinson, a most fitting first presenter at this, our inaugural celebration of biblical preaching. If you don't have a book, The Color of Biblical Preaching, be sure to buy it. Fits every decor, <laughs> and your grandmother would be happy to have them, and your children, you know. <laughs> Two men uh, stood at a bar in downtown Boston. And as men do when they're standing at a bar, they enjoyed the fellowship of the spirits. And one said to the other, where are you from? They said, I'm from Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> you are? Well, I'm from Peoria. Uh, where'd you go to school? Went to Central High. <laughs> I went to Central High. Uh, what, what, what years did you, did you go to Central High? Well, I went from 1988 to 92. <laughs> I 
went to Central High, 1988. What street did you live on? I, uh, I lived on North Adams. <laughs> I lived in, at North Adams. What address? I lived at 1711 North Adams. I lived at 1711 North Adams. And just then the phone rang and the bartender picked it up. It was his wife. She said, well, how's it going, honey? She said, he said, well, it's pretty slow tonight. The only people that are here are the Peterson twins and they're drunk again. <laughs> You really don't have to be drunk to see how much you folks have in common. I mean, you're, most of you are, are Lutherans. Well, that's bad enough, but... Uh, uh, and then uh, you're... I was going to say you're with the Minnesota Twins. Yeah, I think most of you before that. One game playoff tomorrow. The betting is very, very strong. With the, and then tonight... Well, that's going to divide the crowd. The folks from Wisconsin and the folks from Minnesota are going to have a fight. But, you know, you have a lot to go, go for. And then they threw in this conference. I don't know how they arranged it around the sporting events, but I'm delighted to be here, just delighted to be with you. John Stott, the Anglican, has written a book on preaching called Between Two Worlds. And the central image in that book is of a bridge a bridge, of course, uh, spans the gulf between two land masses, a gulf made by a ravine, a river. And so, he says, the preacher is like a bridge. He brings two worlds together, the ancient world of the Bible, the modern world of the 21st century. He serves as a bridge between them. James Cleland, in his book on preaching, argues that the shape of preaching is not a circle with a single center. Instead, he says, the shape of preaching is an ellipse. It has two centers. One center is the man or woman in the world, and the other center is the word. And a good preacher keeps his eye on both. But I'd suggest that the challenge before us as preachers of the scripture is that we have to be inhabitants of several different worlds. For example, one world that we have to enter is the ancient world, the world of the Bible. It's the world that we enter through the skills of exegesis. In that ancient world, there are several things we have to understand. Uh, for example, we need to know the history of that world. When God gave his revelation to men and women, uh, he gave it to people living at a certain time, in a certain place, facing certain pressures, and it's there that we have to see the revelation worked out. It'd be wonderful, I guess, if every 50 years we could get a new revelation, but we haven't. To understand the Bible and what it's saying, you have to know something of its history. For a number of years, uh, Bonnie and I have lived in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And Gloucester, Massachusetts is uh, the oldest fishing community in the United States. It started in 1623. As you might imagine, we have a lot of antique shops on, uh, in Gloucester, Cape Ann, where it's located. Uh, one of the <laughs> antique shops in town. The fellow had a kind of wry New England sense of humor. On one side of the sign it says, we buy old junk. And the other side of the sign says that we sell antiques. <laughs> well, if you like old junk or antiques, <laughs> you'd like Gloucester, Massachusetts. But imagine you were there and uh, you uh, go into one of the stores. Antique stores are not neatly arranged. They just sort of scatter the junk. But you're looking around the store, and over here you see a trunk. It's a gray, dull, but you like old trunks, and uh, you, you sort of lift the lid, and you hear it squeak. But as you look inside, you see it's covered with, with a kind of velvet 
And so you, you rub your hand along the velvet to feel its softness and smoothness. And suddenly, your, your hand hits a lever and a compartment opens. And you find a package of letters. They're tied with a kind of faded red ribbon. And you like old, <laughs> old letters. You put down the trunk, you sit down, and you look at them and you begin to read. It takes a while, but after a few letters, you realize that this is, these letters came from a young man to a young woman. You're not quite sure of the relationship. She may be his uh, friend or girlfriend or even a fiancé or perhaps even a wife. There's a lot in those letters that you would understand as you read them. Young man has left uh, New England, gone to the South to fight. There's a, a grief in them. Uh, several of his uh, friends have been killed in battle. You sense a loneliness as he reaches out to this uh, young woman to whom he's writing. The element of fear. He's got to go into battle again and he's not sure how it'll come out. A lot of things in those letters you'd understand. But if you did not know the history of the United States, there are other things that might escape you. References to first and second battle of Bull Run, Chattanooga, Gettysburg, Chancellorsville. Or references to McClellan, or to Grant, to, to Lee, to Jackson. If you did not know the history of the war between the states, all of that would bewilder you. There's a way in which that's true of the Bible. You can learn a lot, feel a lot of the scriptures as you read them, but unless you know something of the history out of which they come, a, a lot escapes you. Uh, history is important because reading the Bible is like <laughs> like reading somebody else's mail. And you like to know who they were, where they lived. Uh, to read the Bible well, it helps to know the languages of the Bible. <laughs> As a fair disclaimer, I, you don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to really understand the scriptures. It's astonishing how much you can learn just <laughs> reading them in English again and again. But there's some advantage of having been exposed to those original languages, the Greek, the Hebrew. Uh, one is that you're able to make decisions. Uh, as you know, translators uh, are also interpreters. And as uh, translators work through a passage, they have to make decisions. And then when they make these decisions, those decisions make them. For example, if you're Working with Paul's Corinthian correspondence, you read, uh, the love of Christ constrains me. Is that a subjective genitive or an objective genitive? Is that my love for Christ or Christ's love for me? However you do, whatever you do with these, interprets what you're going to do down the line. And it certainly helps as you're reading the passage or the critical commentaries to understand what the arguments are. But there's another advantage of being able to have some familiarity with the languages. Because as you have studied them in school, you become aware of how the people in another culture think. Because language is not simply the way we communicate with others. Language is the way that uh, we communicate with ourselves. We not only speak in languages, we think in languages. Benjamin Lee Wharf uh, was a noted linguist and spent a good part of his life with the Hopi Indians down in our American Southwest. He says that he discovered that the Hopis, who are not a particularly educated people, were able to understand Einstein's theory of relativity when it was explained to them. 
He said the reason for that was that the Hopis have no time in their language. I mean, either something is happening here where they are or happening away from them, but they don't have a sense of time. It's hard for us to even imagine that because in English, <laughs> time is everything. We can talk about the past, the present, the future, the past beyond the past, the future beyond the future, the moving, you know how it goes. We can't think apart from time. <laughs> but the Hopis don't have any time in their language. It's either here or away from them. Einstein said he couldn't have thought of the theory of relativity in English. He said he needed German and mathematics. I don't know what that means, but that's what he said. <laughs> but he also went on to point out that the Inuits, the uh, the Eskimos don't have a single word for snow in their language. They have 17 words for snow. They have words for snow falling, snow hitting the ground, snow beginning to freeze, snow, be you know, 17 words. When Inuits think of snow, they can really think about snow. Just as we do not have a single word for a bread product made from wheat, if I say bread, you think of stuff wrapped in cellophane down at the supermarket or the long loaves that the French people put under their arm and take home. But uh, when I say bread, it doesn't bring bagels to your mind or donuts or bear claws. <laughs> uh, that is, when we think of bread products made from wheat, we can really think about them. And I'm told there are other languages in the world that could not make those distinctions. And therefore, their whole thinking is different. It helps to have an exposure to the languages of the Bible. And it also helps to know the culture. Uh, the biblical writers wrote within a culture. They could no more think without culture than they could think without language. And therefore, to really understand the scriptures, you have to understand the culture from which they came. Uh, Ken Bailey has just two years ago published a book called uh, Jesus Through Mideastern Eyes. Fascinating book, a, a good read. But I think what makes it so fascinating is he sees he lived in that culture all of his life, and he sees what folks like myself would not easily see. You're always faced with cultural issues. David was dealing with that this morning in his sermon. Uh, when you talk about Jesus and his interaction, you have to ask what was going on in the culture. I do a radio program, and uh, it's, it's called Discover the Word, and a couple of years ago, we were working in the Proverbs. Now, the, <laughs> the Proverbs are really kind of a slam dunk. I mean, uh, all the nations of the, in the past had Proverbs. In fact, we do not know of any nation that doesn't have some kind of proverb. So you come to the book of Proverbs and you think, well, of course, this is going to be an easy one. Until you begin to read the dissertations that have been written in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, one thing they have determined is that the last part of Proverbs, at least, is written to young men preparing to go into Solomon's bureaucracy. They're given a lot of advice. In fact, in the last chapter, before you get to that part about women, uh, there's a whole bunch of instruction. If you're a leader, you, you don't want to drink. Clouds your mind. Keeps you from making good decisions. On the other hand, if you've got some fellow over here who's really having a tough time and he's in pain or something, Give him beer. Give him a shot of liquor. Get him out of his misery. 
when I was growing up in Sunday school, they never told me that part. But, uh, <laughs> but you realize there's a lot of instruction there that it's not easy to bring it straight over. Or the first part of the book, you're told not to co-sign a note. <laughs> I mean, the writers are almost ballistic about it. You co-sign the note, get out of it, plead, beg, you know how it is. In our day, we have chapter 11 bankruptcy, chapter seven, you can pick your number. In that day, if you co-signed a note, my note, and I didn't pay, you were gonna pay, and if you didn't pay, you, your wife, your kids could be thrown into slavery. I mean, it was serious consequences to co-signing a note and not delivering. It's probably a good idea not to co-sign a note if you can't <laughs> back it up, but the consequences are not that dire. Culture. Uh, the Bible is steep in the culture of the ancient world, and it's hard to understand it unless you understand its culture. So uh, one world that we have to enter is this world of the ancient world, the world of the Bible, the world that we enter through exegesis. But there's a second world that we have to be part of. That's the modern world, the world of the 21st century, the world that people in homiletics are concerned about. And this world too, as you well know, has a history. Somehow in the church, at least talking about the folks I know, we have ignored history. But history doesn't ignore us. History keeps setting the agenda, demanding that it be heard. I remember the first time I ever talked to a couple about an abortion. It was 1965. I was working with the Christian Medical Dental Association, Dallas, working with the group over in the med school. And the young couple came to me and uh, they told me that uh, he was in involved in a program which he was going to specialize in a very sub-specialty in medicine. So he's going to have to get out of med school, he's going to go on and take a residency and then a residency after that. And as they could see it, at least 10 years would pass before he'd get into the practice of medicine. And he discovered that uh, she was pregnant. At that time, uh, med students were not allowed to work. She was working to earn a living. <laughs> and suddenly, all of their plans were disrupted because they were gonna have a baby. Admittedly, it was not the most convenient time for them to have a child. But they said, uh, they came to say, the reason they came to talk to me was, they wondered if in their case it would be all right to have an abortion. <laughs> I can still remember my own feelings. Had they said, you know, we have a two-year-old and he's driving us nuts, it would be all right to kill him, I could have understood that, but I wouldn't have agreed to it. <laughs> At that time, every state in the Union had laws against abortion. In 1968, Colorado and Hawaii opened it up because they said uh, you could have an abortion not only if the woman's life was at stake, but if her mental health was threatened. Those are great loopholes. And then as you know, in 1973, the Supreme Court Roe versus Wade, opened it up so it became the law of the land. Since that time, every year, 
over a million pre-borns are killed in our country. That's changed everything. But see what that does for you. If the, if the statistics mean anything, the chances are that 20% of the women in your congregation will have had an abortion. You come to realize the evil of it. You come down from the mountain to thunder against this. But before you pray, play that prophetic role, you better play the pastoral role. What does it do to a woman in your congregation who has an abortion, has had an abortion? How does that sermon affect her? Now, we've ignored history, but history doesn't ignore us. <laughs> when history changes things, it changes us. I wish, I wish that the reason that uh, we integrated it in our country was because of theologians from evangelical seminaries and Lutheran seminaries got together and read the book of Ephesians and said the middle wall of partition is broken down. Maybe that applies to African Americans and Caucasians. <laughs> That's not what happened. Rosa Parks got on a bus down in Birmingham. Uh, she was tired and uh, she didn't want to sit in the back of the bus. There wasn't much room for where the black people sat. So she sat up in the front and the uh, bus driver made a big issue of it. She refused to move. And that was a spark that brought the country ablaze and it costs a great deal to bring integration. I say it to our shame that uh, many of the churches actually opposed integration. Since that time there have been books written about that occasion and the churches that uh, <laughs> the churches that opposed it argued that we preach the gospel but we we didn't preach the social gospel. I mean, history was in the streets. History was rioting. The churches went on as though nothing had happened. <laughs> we can ignore history, but it doesn't ignore us. It sets the agenda. And preachers have to be aware of it. We have uh, the language of the 21st century. Uh, the language of the pulpit is the language of the koine, language of the marketplace. It's that language at its best. Uh, but somehow there has been in the church a kind of language and tone that is divorceful and goes on in the marketplace. Can you imagine uh, what would happen if after service one day a <laughs> pastor goes to a McDonald's and he's going to catch something for lunch and he says to the young woman, I would like to have three Cokes, an order of French fries. You know, she'd think he'd lost his mind. I mean, the language of the marketplace and the language of the pulpit are the same. It's the language of the Volkswagen Act. Uh, Spurgeon was on to something when he said that the people in the marketplace cannot learn the language of the academy. The people in the academy have to learn the language of the marketplace. And we have a culture. When I think of culture, I think of colored paper. It's over our eyes. Uh, some of us uh, who are from the United States may have um, red paper over our eyes. Some from Asia may have green paper. Some from Latin America, purple paper. 
We all look out through this paper. We see the same thing, really, maybe. But there's some things with the colored paper we don't see. And the colored paper over my eyes is different than over your eyes. It, it's sort of like the air we breathe, this culture. And preachers have to be aware of it. I mean, how in the United States, how do we preach the lordship of Christ in a Republican or democracy? I mean, every two years, the people in the House of Representatives come and ask for their vote, ask for our vote. Every four years, the presidential candidates come. Every six years, the people from the Senate come. We put them in, we take them out. And then we stand up to talk to our people about Jesus Christ as Lord. We find ourselves falling into it. We say, uh, make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. He's not running for election. <laughs> Isn't that? A lot of people think the doctrine of election is, I say yes, the devil says yes. Uh, you know, and the middle one says no. How do you preach that? The, the message, the first sermon that was ever preached by Peter, uh, the central message was God has made him Lord in Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's not asking for our vote. It's if you succumb to him and bow to him, make him your Lord, in that sense, it's fine. If you turn your back on his lordship, you'll be separated from him forever. How do you preach grace in a country like ours? The great national anthem of the United States a few years ago was, uh, <laughs> you deserve a break today. <laughs> in fact, everything we got, we deserved. There was a Buick ad a few years ago in which uh, the light is on, and uh, top story of the office building. There's only one car, a big new Buick, um, st sitting in the parking lot. And then the light goes off and the voiceover says, you have worked hard, you've gotten to the top. Now you deserve your prize. The man gets into this Buick and <laughs> takes off. Buick is not to get you from point A to point B. The Buick is designed to leave your neighbor in the very exhaust fumes. <laughs> but how do you preach grace in a situation like that? How do you really preach grace when you say that everything we have, we earn for it, we earn, it's owed to us, it's ours? When the Scripture says that anything short of hell is pure grace. The water you drink, pure grace. How do you preach it in a culture like ours? There's a third world we enter. Not only the ancient world, the world of the Bible, the modern world, but the particular world in which we minister. I think it's in Bainton's introduction to Martin Luther that Bainton says that every man or woman who's ever influenced his or her age for God has first of all been caught up in the spirit of that age and then is able to stand outside and preach a word of judgment and grace. But the particular world that you minister to, that's where you speak that word of judgment and grace. I'm talking about the world of the zip code, the world of Fifth and Main, your particular congregation. 
You have to know that too, don't you? It is a history. And that history has affected that congregation. When I was teaching at Dallas Seminary in the pastoral ministry department, the students had to do a project. And one of the students had just taken a church in East Texas. And he thought it'd be interesting to do a, a history of his church. <laughs> we let him do it. <laughs> when you're looking for projects, you take almost anything. <laughs> but he did the history. He found it in the, uh, this was about 1973. He found it in the uh, late 1950s, a young black man had raped a white woman. They formed a vigilante commission committee and they got this young black man and put him on a rough cross, set a fire underneath it and burned him to death. And then, uh, a few years later, they had a split in the church. A big city, if people don't like this church, they can go across the street or down the way to another church. Small towns, you can't do that. <laughs> I mean, if you leave the, the Lutheran church and go to the Methodist church, everybody knows it. And what happens when that occurs, not only does the church split, families split, and businesses split, and people are affected by it. He discovered they had a split in this church. And the pain was deep and great. So he would go door to door inviting people to come to the services. <laughs> they all remember that young man who was burned. They all had felt the power of that split. Nobody told them about that in the pulpit committee when they called them. <laughs> but it was there in the church, it was there in the community. It happens in our churches. You come out of seminary and you're alive and vital and you want to get something started to reach out into the community. And you have the program, you bring it to the people and you're enthusiastic. And oh, somehow it's a wide yawn as they hear it. But the reason is they've been there a long time. They've had a lot of people come. They told them they were going to win the world through the junior department, or they were going to use evangelistic explosion, or they, you know, they, they've gone through all of them. And the pastor was there for like three years and then left. At least in our country and other areas. Average pastor spends about three years at his church. <laughs> It takes you five, six years even to get to know the church. But the difficulty is, if you don't know the history, all kinds of things are going on. <laughs> Churches have languages, don't they? I, uh, I grew up in the ghetto of New York City. I. Uh, Never plowed a field. And when I was the president at Denver Seminary, I was invited to speak at Aurora, Nebraska. Aurora, Nebraska is not the end of the world, but if you stand on a <laughs> barn and look out, you can almost see it out there. And I got to this town, and the only hotel in town, and I wondered how I got there. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> I looked at my notes, and the invitation had come with the Greater Nebraska Crusade for Christ. So I had visions of being <laughs> able to speak to a hundred people that lived in Nebraska. And, uh, <laughs> Next day, when they came to pick me up, uh, I asked about this paper. And I said, Well, back uh, 15 years ago, uh, Merv Roselle 
came through here, had a big crusade. We didn't want to waste the paper, so we've been using it ever since. <laughs> Next morning, I realized I was out of my class, overmatched, and went to breakfast at the restaurant near the, at the hotel. I said to a couple, as they were in line, an older couple, I said, do you folks farm? Yeah, I, I said, tell you what, I'll buy you breakfast if I can ask you some questions. <laughs> that was a good deal. So I sat there and I asked them questions. I am sure I am the only person who ever asked them those questions. You know, uh, when do you plant? When do you reap? Uh, what do you plant? Where do you get the seed? You know, on and on and on. <laughs> When I lived at Denver, and I was there, at, back in Denver, I'd get up at 5 in the morning, turn on the radio, 5 after 5 in the morning, had the farm report. I, I listened to it every day because I wanted to get the weather and other stuff. And, you know, uh, cattle were 72 cents. I had no idea what that was. You buy a whole cow for 75? You know... Uh, <laughs> What do you buy for 72 cents? <laughs> I discovered this, the people in Aurora, Nebraska know. It's very important to them, <laughs> but I didn't. So I asked them all these questions, and good thing I did. I had some <laughs> illustrations I thought I could use. <laughs> oh, no, 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 they all know you're an outsider. <laughs> um, great people in Aurora, Nebraska, just great people. They tolerated me. But uh, it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't a place I was, you know, happy with. I uh, I think if God called me to Aurora, Nebraska, He'd have to have two angels and write it in the sky. <laughs> but there were pastors there who had been in California before and the bigger cities who loved it. And they understood it. They were part of it. They spoke the language. When I was at Denver, we had a fellow from England come over to speak. It was his first trip to the United States. <laughs> He'd gone through Chicago. He came to Denver. And I, I give him uh, 20 points for trying. He was using an illustration. He said that when he had been in Chicago, they had taken him to see the White Stockings play. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he said uh, it was a very exciting game because uh, they were playing the team from New York, uh, and uh, he didn't quite remember what that was. But he said each, <laughs> each team had had its eight sides, got to the last part of the last side, and one of the white stockings hit a four base hit, and they won. <laughs> we knew what that meant, but we also know he wasn't one of us. <laughs> white socks, yeah, white stockings, no. A homer, <laughs> single, two base hit, three base hit. You know, uh, we, he and I, we, he communicated, and it was quaint, <laughs> but he wasn't one of us. You've got to learn the language, don't you? And the culture. Oh, there's a culture where you minister. Uh, culture that I, I, don't, I don't know, but you better know it. A graduate of Denver Seminary who was up in Wyoming. And uh, I went up to preach for him one time. He was doing well. Had a church of about uh, 350 in a town, about, you know, 200. That's a mega church up in Wyoming. <laughs> and he, uh, he said to me, Prop, you know, I, I, I have a recurrent nightmare. And that is, at, at the harvest season, I have a nightmare that you come to church and you're sitting in the back row. And he said, 
when I, where did I get, you know, guys were getting a weed in, he said, I get out there and help him. Grew up doing it, and I'm out there helping. I get maybe an hour or two hours to study. Sermons aren't very good. But you don't, you gotta understand up here, you gotta, <laughs> wheat's everything. I would not have the slightest idea what to do with a wheat harvest, but he did. He's growing up with it. And he fit. So, <laughs> there's one other world that we have to think about. Not only the ancient world, the world of the Bible, or modern world, the world that we enter with harmonics, particular world in which we serve. But it's the world represented by those dark figures in the circle. It's your world. You bring something to that world. And the question is, who are you? When you study the text, you study the text. I think women read a text different than men. African Americans read it different than Caucasians. People from Latin America are different than us. But who are you? Not only the question of <laughs> what does the text do to you, but what do you do to the text? You're caught up in this culture. You can talk about it as though it's out there, but it's not. You're part of it too, aren't you? You have a history. If you grew up in a home in which uh, You had an abusive father. It shapes your whole view of God. Just two weeks ago, I was talking to a young man who's in constant pain. I mean, the only difference is some days it's, it's unbearable, other days it's there, but it's always there. And can't get medicine to calm it down. And he said to me, you know, when I was growing up, my father was always on us. He'd come in sometimes and just beat us for no reason at all. He said, I know theologically it's not true, but I can't help believe that this is what God's like. We all bring ourselves to our ministry. Who are you? I think you could give psychological tests to people in a group like this or other groups, and you could pick up the ones who are strongly reformed and those who are Arminian and whatever else in between. Because out of the infinitude that is God, we, we, we make our choices. I know it's true of me. <laughs> I believe in the depravity of women and men. I mean, I have no doubt about it. I think it's the best proved doctrine of the Christian faith. Uh, having been president of two seminaries, nothing has dissuaded me. And the great thing about depravity, I mean, depravity we all suffer from a curvature of the soul, poison blood in our veins. Nobody ever disappoints you. <laughs> it's just the reality. I also believe in grace. It's in the fabric of my being. We have a friend who is a physician, Dallas area. He and his wife had a home out at uh, Tyler, Texas. Uh, Tyler is a place they grow roses. They call it the rose capital of the world. He was at a low ebb in his life. Uh, life just seemed so bleak. They went down to their home in Tyler for a few days. And he said he was sitting on the back porch looking at, at the roses that his wife had planted. And the day before, she had, uh, had a farmer dump a load of manure on those roses to get them to grow. 
And he's <laughs> sitting there looking at the roses, smelling that manure. And he said, suddenly it dawned on me that God grows roses out of manure piles. Not the best statement of the doctrine, <laughs> but a clear statement. God grows roses out of manure piles. If you can't handle the manure, get out of the ministry. Sometimes you find it's up to your kneecaps. <laughs> But always out of that, there's a working of God in which roses grow. And certainly our uh, opportunity to point out to people what God has been doing in the smell of the manure. That's not the only two doctrines. Those are not the only two doctrines of the faith. I need other people to remind me of other doctrines. But I know they come to me Anyway, the challenge of being a biblical preacher is that it takes all of you. And you can do things that I can't do. You can be at places I can't be. It puts new meaning into what Jesus said when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. It's a challenge to be a citizen aware of different worlds. All right. Uh, do you have uh, my the battery of my watch went out, so I have to find out what time it is. Uh, do you have any questions? Excuse me? The world of the kingdom of God. How does that fit into it? I'm sorry, I didn't. I... The world of the kingdom of God. Oh, the world, it's always there. Within it, around it, uh, not separate from it in a sense that we can talk about it and not really be aware of these. That's a great question. It's, uh, the world to which we are oriented ultimately is that, is that kingdom and that king. And we represent him in the midst of it all. Good question. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> in increasingly in the church, <clears throat> I meet people who have either been in the church so long uh, <clears throat> that they have decided to investigate, which I think is good, their faith, but the options available to them are the Jesus Seminar or um, other things that, that are not necessarily uh, balanced for them. Uh, it's just one particular point of view. Or I find people who come, young people, who don't really know the, the story of the Bible. And I don't know how to relate very well to either of those worlds. <laughs> well, the second one I, I can really vibrate with because there is a biblical illiteracy today. And any assumption that uh, people who are new to the church know the scriptures It's just not true. I mean, even at a seminary level, we have some great people at Gordon Conwell, but those who came to know the Lord in college have a great ignorance of, uh, of, of the biblical material. Uh, doubt, devout as they are, they are missing what, you know, people who grew up in the church seem to know. Good, good part about it, though, is that you, you tell them the stories, it's all new. I mean, when I was growing up, you went to church a lot. You know, you had Daniel and the lions. Then you could name all the lions. Uh, 
not this crowd. Uh, I, uh, and I think we have to come to grips with ways of helping people get the biblical content, not just the stories, but the stories in some kind of context. Uh, if you don't know the, the, you know the basic text of the Bible, you're really at a disadvantage. You're going to end up just, you know, looking, you never preach the Old Testament, preach the New Testament. Uh, and the, the first thing you were asking me about, I, my, I haven't answered your question, I'm just pretending I have. I find people who've been in my church a long time. Yeah. People who've been in the church a, a long time in my church now turning to uh, away from central message oh, yeah. to more uh, radical understanding of scripture. Um, I think many people are bored. So and they'll go for something else, but the, they're bored. For them, it's the same old, same old, and so uh, something else comes along, and they're attracted to it. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the curse of boredom in preaching is just that. That is, it's not only a bad uh, way of, uh, poor way of communicating, it's a destroyer of life and hope, and it is for people who've been around it a long time. Uh, and I think that's why they go off for the fads. Uh, and not only do they go off, they try to bring other people with them. Uh, and there's uh, no easy answer if uh, If we're content to say the same thing the same way Sunday after Sunday. Uh, one of the glorious things about the Bible is that the major way God communicated his truth was through narrative, through story. And story has a way of uh, coming in under the radar, stealth bomber. Jesus uses it. And I think we have to get that that ability to tell the story again, but not the same old story the same old way, but to tell it from different vantages and so forth. Easy for me to say, hard for people to do. Christ. Yeah. How do you engage it without shutting down the people of your congregation? Yeah, I think one of the things that has happened over the last couple of decades is uh, well-meaning people have so politicized the gospel that when they hear, when the outsiders hear who we are, they automatically assume our positions. If I'm on a plane, I try, <laughs> try not to let the person next to me you know, know I'm a preacher. Uh, <laughs> Tony Campolo taught sociology at Eastern, who's also a preacher. He said, when he got on a plane and he was tired, didn't want to talk, and somebody said, well, what do you do? He said, I'm a Baptist preacher. They killed him. <laughs> He said, if you wanted to engage in me, he said, I'm a sociologist. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think the great problem is that there hasn't been a clean political issue since the crucifixion. And if we start with the politics, we're going to end up talking of uh, politics with a religious flavor. If we preach the Bible, there are principles that come through the scriptures. And um, I don't think in the pulpit I want to associate that with the uh, Republicans or Democrats. 
but there are principles that we are for that um, that I, I think come out of the text. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's amazing to me. This, is, this is, gives me a chance to get off. But, you know, Roman Polinski, the director, raped a 13-year-old girl. And now, uh, 32 years later, they, you know, they just want to follow through on it because he, he left the country. And he gets people defending him on the fact, on the basis that he's produced three or four good films. But if his name was Father Polensky or Reverend Polensky, you would not hear a word out of Hollywood. Um, and our problem is that today religion has been given this low road because when we have gotten involved in the politics of it, uh, we have not handled it well. Um, we looked at as bigots, and, and, uh, and that's not really what we've done. It's what we've been made to look at. Have been made to look at. Tough to to take a political stand in the pulpit without it already being prejudged as negative or positive. I, there, there are probably political issues to which we can speak issues. I'm very much, you, we really can't, uh, you know, have one candidate. Um, but um, you talk about biblical integrity. Who cries for it? And, uh, yeah, I, you're raising a great question. I I think you can discuss things privately that you can't do publicly. Um, Walter Judd was a congressman from Indiana, ten year ten terms. Uh, he didn't campaign much. He figured if I'm doing a good job, they'll put me back in, and if I'm not doing a good job, they'll take me out. And he told me he didn't go to his pastor when, when he had some political problems. He said, in my pastor, the, the good is always the enemy of the best. And he said, I haven't had the privilege of voting on that for years, aside from the date you're going to have Thanksgiving. He said, uh, what happens in Congress is I put in a bill, a good bill, I put it in, goes through committee, and it comes out. And then you have a bill that's 60% good, 40% bad. Do you vote for the 60% good because you have to take and take the 40% bad? Or if it's 60% bad, 40% good, are you willing to take the 60% bad to get this 40% good? And uh, that's the kind of politics, that's the kind of question you get in politics. And you can't deal with that easily from the pulpit. You know, just the, the, the pulpit is, it just it doesn't work that well. But it's a major question in a day like ours. Okay. Where are we? What a time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.